Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. It's just occurred to me that some of my new viewers may not know what this pin is on my lapel. Well, it's the Sierra Space Dream Chaser, the successor to the Space Shuttle, and it's going to be going into orbit sometime early next year. Sierra Space just unveiled the finished product, which is about to be handed over to NASA for final testing before it goes to orbit on top of a Vulcan Centaur, hopefully sometime in April. But what is this spacecraft and what makes it so important? Well, I'm going to answer that question while showing you some excerpts from an exclusive tour that I took of Sierra Space's facility a little over a year ago. And I'm telling you something, I can't wait for this ship to launch to orbit early next year. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Wasn't really planning to do another update today, wanted to take a break from content, but Sierra Space recently had other ideas and I really felt that delaying this video any longer really wouldn't be a great idea because lots of viewers really want to hear about what's going on with Sierra Space's new space plane, also known as the Dream Chaser. For those of you unfamiliar with this amazing spacecraft, well, it dates all the way back to the 1980s and the Soviet Union with a curious space plane known as the Bor 4, B-O-R-4, which NASA later reverse engineered and turned into their own idea for a human landing system. Now, this was before the space shuttle was going to be abandoned, and I don't think I think anybody had the slightest idea as to how important and how promising this concept was going to ultimately become. And now, about 40 years after the Soviets first came up with the idea, Sierra Space is putting it into practice and it most probably will be launching in six months or less. The reverse-engineered Soviet project was called the HL-20 Personnel Launch System, and NASA originally was intending to use it to resupply and perhaps take passengers up to the Space Station Freedom, which of course never took shape. And when it was handed off to Sierra Space, the idea was always to make it a human-rated spacecraft, and indeed, at the beginning of the Commercial Crew Project, Sierra Space, known as Sierra Nevada in those days, received a contract contract from NASA to develop a human-rated spacecraft, but unfortunately, the project was handed off to Boeing and a more conservative capsule known as Starliner, and of course, all of us are familiar with what that has turned out like. And even though NASA didn't choose Dream Chaser to be its commercial crew alternative, it did select Dream Chaser to be an alternative for bringing cargo up to the ISS, which is what Sierra Space has been working on ever since, although though they intend to have a human-rated Dream Chaser ready by 2026. So let's go ahead and get introduced to this spacecraft through perhaps its best representative, Angie Wise, who is Chief Safety Officer and Senior Vice President of Mission and Quality Assurance over at Sierra Space. And by the way, if you want to see the whole thing, well, I have both parts of this tour linked at the end of this video. And to my knowledge, this is still the most comprehensive tour of the Sierra Space facilities available on YouTube. This is Angie, by the way, a Vice President of Safety and Mission Assurance. Uh, this young lady makes sure that everything here goes according to plan, that there are multiple points of failure before anything goes wrong with Dream Chaser. So this is the person that makes sure that everything stays safe on this ship. I wouldn't want that kind of responsibility. That's okay, I've got a really strong team behind me. So they have amazing ways of not only identifying what could go wrong, even stronger engineers that tell us how we're gonna prevent any of those things from occurring. Fantastic. So it makes my job a little bit easier. Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, when I look at this vehicle though, so some of the things that are both different and the same as the cargo vehicle that we're building right now, um, we'll start with the aero surfaces. When we re-enter, we're going 17,500 miles per hour approximately. So we're going a pretty good clip. And there are seven surfaces on our vehicle that 
doesn't move, and that's what burns off that energy and gets us to the shuttle landing facility, the SLS. So if you look here, um, we've got two lower body flaps, so these would fold down. We have two upper body flaps. We have flaps on each wing, and then we have the rudder that moves as well, which is what you saw in that video earlier. Okay, so that is what is really helping us during the re-entry phase. So instead of, instead of a capsule where all you're doing is just you know, pointing the heat shield at the atmosphere and bleeding off speed, mm -hmm. you guys have a lot more moving parts in this. Absolutely. How, how does that, you know, what sort of challenges does that represent in terms of the sophistication of the reentry process? It is much more sophisticated, but it also allows us to land on a runway. So that gives us an ability to have a more gentle landing and approach. And then once we land on that runway, it gives you much faster access to the science coming off the vehicle. So you're not losing as much data as you're sitting there in gravity. So that's why, although it's a more complicated system to fly a space plane, it also brings a lot of benefits to us as soon as we get to that runway. And how does this differ to, from how the shuttle landed? I mean, people look at this and they think space shuttle. You know, how does this differ? This is very shuttle-like in that we are going to go ahead and have the same type of maneuvers during the re-entry portion to get to that runway. We are landing at the very same place at the orbiter has landed. Um, the difference is here is how some of this vehicle provides its lift to the, compared to the orbiter and also the size of the vehicle is much smaller than what the orbiter was as well. So what you're looking at here is a two-scale two version of the rocket that we're going to be flying on for our first mission. And you can see if we had x-ray vision what Dream Chaser looks like inside the vehicle, inside that fairing. So it definitely gives you a feel for the scale of how large that launch vehicle is and what we would look like when you sit on the launch pad. And we can land on any runway that's 8,000 feet long. So a lot of runways um, are available to us. When we went to the crew version, or to the cargo version instead of the crew, there were some changes that we made. We had the ability now to take up more cargo if we add on a cargo module. So what you're seeing here are, are what were our abort motors for the crew. Right. Instead now we're standing in the cargo module space. Gotcha. Um, so these are gone right now. And also, since we're not flying crew, we don't have to have that abort system. So we get to go into a rocket. We're launch vehicle agnostic. So as long as it has enough lift capability and a five meter fairing, we can now fold our wings in and fit inside that rocket to launch. Um, and that also will allow us to fit our cargo module in there as well. So when I look at this vehicle, the differences are one, wings are folded in and we are standing where the cargo module is, which we'll go take a look at. So to clarify, if you, in the future, if you're sending this up with a crew you're not attaching shooting star to the back because would that sabotage your abort system or would you still have a way to abort with shooting star sure when we fly crew we do have to modify the design in a few different ways to add that abort system back in but we can also leverage our shooting star design in that um, so there's there's different ways that we're gonna when we go back to crew it will look different than the original version it'll also look different than our cargo version one of those is we're gonna go back on top of a rocket and fix our wings because we need to be able to abort and no longer be in a fairing. Frequently get questions about the landing skid. Um, why a skid and not a wheel or a tire in there? There's a couple of reasons for that. One, this fits up very nicely inside the vehicle, takes up less space. Less space for our hardware means more cargo that we can take up for our customers. Um, the other thing is this is still a high heating area during re-entry, so there's less failure modes associated with having the skid there versus a wheel. So obviously this looks like mission control to me. So, you know, tell me a little bit more about this. Tell me about flight, FDO, SNO, that sort of thing. You know, what all do we have going Yes, on here? we are sitting in our mission control center here. Um, when we fly Dream Chaser, this is where we're gonna be flying Dream Chaser for all of our missions. And what we're doing right now with this room is we're making sure that everything is synced up with the NASA systems, that all of our software works properly. And we use this as a training opportunity for our team because they're gonna be listening to multiple loops on the headset and training them on how to communicate with each other. Um, each of these seats have a different meaning. So if you look at something that says EPS, maybe in the front right corner, that's our electrical um, power system, right? And then the other part is going to be our ECLIS, which is our environmental control and life support. So each one of those have a different seat. They understand their specialty within that system. And when we say go for flight, the flight director here in the back is going to check with each one of these people to make sure all their systems are go before we do any um, commands or maneuvering with the vehicle. Now, 
Now, what happens if you have catastrophic failure in mission control here? We, what happens if somehow you lose communication? Yeah, so just like how Houston has a backup center at Marshall Space Flight Center, we have a backup center in Florida as well. Okay. So you want to have dissimilar redundancy. We don't want to be in the same location. If there's a bad day here, let's go to a different part of the country so we can stand up there and we'll have 24-hour operations going even if there was some kind of failure here. But primary mission control is going to be handled out of Denver. Absolutely. Is that correct? And that's something I bet you a lot of people don't know is that such important space operations for the future future of space flight in general yep. is going to be right out of here out of little old Denver and that's that's pretty neat stuff especially speaking as a Colorado native oh okay. um that's yep. neat stuff I will throw, throw out from our Louisville fans we're in Louisville Colorado and yes. so <laughs> <laughs> we're very close to Denver though but I want to make sure our Louisville team yes. who's went through a lot in our community here in the past few months understand what a gym they have yes where we're going now is we're going into our cargo mock-up room. I should tell you, when we walk in here, there are some controls. So this is a humidity controlled area. We do pump in humidity. What you're looking at here are our pressurized areas of the tenacity and the shooting star. So when I say pressurized areas, we're talking about where the crew members can go in and out of so that we didn't need to put in things like the wings right now. But the reason that we have this here is so that we can practice loading and unloading our car. Cargo. So when NASA gives us cargo, what they give us is these bags that you can see up here, those cloth white bags up there right. of different shapes and sizes. Okay. So what our team members have to do, these can still be very heavy bags, is our ground crew needs to practice loading and unloading that cargo. We know exactly how it should look in the models and where every bag should go, but it's kind of like professional Tetris when you actually need to go and physically put those bags in, strap them down, and make sure they're secured for flight. So this is where we practice. Um, you can see if you peeked into the uh, tenacity's habitable volume, there's piping and there's strapping and those types of things. So this gives our team some actual experience working inside that vehicle. Um, we have a higher fidelity mock-up that is also down at Johnson Space Center. Am I permitted uh, to have a peek or not? So you can go up on this platform, but okay. not into the vehicle. That's fine. Just here, we're gonna. You can follow me up. Um, we do get larger as you get to the forward portion of the vehicle as well. So yeah, I mean, this is really vast. I don't know if it's obvious to you guys at home as to just how much space we're talking about here. But once again, this is just Dream Chasers cargo cap capability here. And it's big. I mean, if I, I could, uh, you could definitely put three or four of me to end to end and I'm six foot two. So that's a lot of space, and there's even more space over there. Now one detail that is seldom discussed by the media is the fact that Dream Chaser is actually two spacecraft instead of one. It can carry a total of five and a half metric tons worth of cargo because of the Shooting Star module that is attached to the back. However, the Shooting Star is not just a cargo module. It is also a spacecraft unto itself with its own propulsion system, its own solar panels, and it is capable of secondary missions after the primary mission is complete. And before I show you more, I would like to thank Glenipeg Jets and also Peter Priel. Mike Dahlgren and Dean Illinger for becoming Patreon supporters recently. It's because of help from people like you that I'm able to do tours like this. So thanks so much. And if you'd like to join them, all the details are in the description. Now let's get a closer look at Shooting Star. So obviously we have shooting stars sitting right here. Can you tell us about capabilities, advantages over other cargo delivery systems, etc.? And it's maybe its capabilities as an independent space station of its own. I've heard about that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Shooting Star does have an amazing amount of capabilities, especially when it is partnered up with our uncrewed Dream Chaser. We call it our UDC or Tenacity, right? The reason that we uh, take advantage of both of those systems is one gives us that return capability that NASA desires, but NASA also desires a disposal capability. And so this gives them both of their desired requirements. They generate trash just like we do. So with our cargo module, that's the one thing that we can jettison off, get rid of some of the cargo that they don't need anymore or any of their payloads, and we still have all of that capability to return Dream Chaser to the runway and get the rest of their items that they do want to have access to. Um, you're right, we do have the solar arrays. We have thermal control on that. So there are a 
a lot of opportunities to repurpose the cargo or the shooting star um, to go off and perform other missions depending on what the customer's needs are. Right. And by the way, I, the scale of this thing, I don't know if it's obvious, but as you can see from the steps going up to that thing, this is a big cargo module, guys. This thing is really large. And that, in many ways, is another advantage, right, is the fact that you have the capability. Don't you have external pods that you can put we on do. as well yep. for larger pieces of cargo? Absolutely. NASA has a desire for both pressurized and, un and unpressurized payloads. So what they ask us to do is we have different configurations of that cargo module where we can put that external cargo, either take it up to the ISS or bring it back home. NASA does make us aware of what they want to take up or bring home for every single mission. So we can outfit that shooting star very specific to their needs on that mission. Right. So if you look at how large this vehicle is, um, when May you- I approach the- Sure, the, you can go up to the, the platform, sure. So at least to so once again, I'm 6'2 and 250 pounds. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> this thing's big. It carries a lot of cargo. And so you got that and that when you're talking about re resupplying the ISS. Pretty impressive. Yeah, no, it is. It's it's a good size vehicle, provides up a lot of capability for us on up mass. Um, you can see if you look in there, there's a tunnel that our crew members are going to float in and out of whenever they get to the International Space Station. Um, when we berth with the International Space Station, it's this portion of the vehicle that will mate. That narrow down part towards the front of our shooting star is the part that mates up with our uh, tenacity vehicle. And then you just have about 15 feet and another 30 feet of cargo capability. This was the state of affairs in the summer of 2022 when I had an opportunity to take this tour. And at the time, they were thinking that first quarter 2023 was really doable. Obviously, some problems have come up between now and then, but when it comes right down to it, it was never going to be possible to launch Dream Chaser in 2023 anyway, given the state of Vulcan Centaur. And of course, we want to make sure that this flight goes right the first time. But but I had an opportunity to see some amazing things happening with this spacecraft, including a load-bearing test when it soared over the entire warehouse. That was quite an amazing thing to see, and I just happened to be taking the tour on the day that they carried out this test. It had been pretty much immobile up to that point. It was an exciting moment for everybody, including myself. But that was then, and this is now. What happens with Dream Chaser at this point is a few tests with NASA being carried out at the Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Sandusky, Ohio, roughly 57 miles west of Cleveland. By the way, I'm really hoping I get an opportunity to see some of those tests in action, but that's kind of an open question right now. And after that, it's off to Cape Canaveral with a projected launch window somewhere in April of 2024, a little over a year late but I've seen far worse performance out of other companies. Are you listening, Boeing? So that being the case, if they can pull this off, it's going to be an amazing accomplishment to say the least. And what's coming in the near future is even more excited. A human rated Dream Chaser in 2026 and also a space station being serviced by Dream Chaser by 2028. I am so impressed with what Sierra Space has done, especially mostly with private funding and not with taxpayer money. I can't wait to see what they do next. Please like, please subscribe. It's very important to my channel and please check the description for various ways to support this content and as always, stay angry about space.